Hello, and welcome to WonderCon's Culinary Adventures in Dungeons and Dragons panel. Uh, my name is Kyle Newman. I am a filmmaker and also an author and part of uh, an amazing team of guys here um, who uh, reassembled recently to collaborate on the first official Dungeons and Dragons cookbook. And we had previously worked on another book called Dungeons and Dragons Art and Arcana, a visual history of the brand. There it is right there. And uh, we were very excited to reunite for this uh, because it's such an interesting off the beaten track topic when you think of RPGs and tabletop gaming. Um, but it's totally germane to, to fandom and the immersiveness of Dungeons and Dragons. And this was an expedition we set out. Uh, we weren't sure where we were going to go or how it was going to go, but here we are months after its release. And it, we, I can say it was a successful release. I'm really proud of the book and the way everyone has received uh, the book. And it, it's really something I as a fan was uh, happy to get involved in too. And um, I want to introduce you to the other people here, my, my collaborators on this book, the co-authors, which we reassembled. We've got Michael Whitwer, Michael broadcasting from Chicago. How's it going, Michael? Hey, I can't complain. It's uh, it's getting warmer every day, so that's something. And uh, Michael also is a author of Empire of Imagination, which is a, a great book about uh, Gary Gygax, a, a biography. Um, and we also have John. Are you broadcasting from San Diego, John? I am indeed. John um, wrote a wonderful book, Playing Up the World. And also he has this one out. He's not going to promote it, but I'm going to put it up there for you. You guys should <laughs> Look check at this that. out. This just came out of Christmas, The Elusive Shift. Um, it's about uh, role-playing games, forging the forged identity of role-playing games. Um, really, really great book. And um, so we all do different things in our day jobs. And um, we all do side projects. But we reunited for this special project, which was... Um, like I said, surprising, but very, became very dear to us because we all are foodies in a sense. And um, Michael, you want to talk about how this unique project came to us, how it came to be and, and how we kind of put the band back together? Absolutely, Kyle. Uh, and, and again, uh, thanks for your introduction. Um, and, and thank you, WonderCon, for, for having us. We're really excited to be here. Um, so yeah, this was, this was an odd one, wasn't it? We um, and you said, you know, how the book came to us. And, and that is a very accurate description because this book actually, someone did approach us about doing this book. Um, you know, unlike Art and Arcana, where, where uh, you know, originally you actually came to me uh, after I'd written Art Empire of Imagination. And we started having conversations about that. And we put this team together to, um, to go ahead and kind of build that idea. It took it to Wizards and, and so forth. Um, you know, this was a very different project. Um, so we were wrapping up Art and Arcana uh, in 2018. And that had gone very well. Uh, we were very proud of that book. I mean, that was an exciting, um, anyone that hasn't uh, checked out uh, Dungeons and Dragons Art and Arcana, that was, uh, that was our comprehensive 45 year visual history uh, of D&D. Um, a lot of focus on the art of the game. And, and it was really, really a fun archeology span project digging up all this old stuff that nobody had seen in some cases for 40 or 50 years um, and, and kind of publishing it for the first time in, 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 you know, in its full form. Really exciting project. So we all loved uh, working on that together. Certainly this team, um, obviously us three here, plus my brother, Sam, who was a collaborator, uh, collaborator on that book. Um, and uh, so what ended up happening was the publisher, um, we were working with Penguin Random House on that book. Uh, the publisher, um, specifically the imprint was 10 Speed Press. And this particular publisher was also over a few different imprints. And one of them was Clarkson Potter. And Clarkson Potter is really well known for a number of things, especially cookbooks. Um, they're the publisher of the Barefoot Contessa series. So you're talking about some really, really major cookbooks. So our publisher came to us and said, hey, you know, one thing that we do a lot here is cookbooks. You know, we, we know this space really well. And I've had this idea for a number of years of doing a DD and d cookbook. You know, our publisher is very passionate about D&D. That's how we got together in the first place for Art and Arcana. And, uh, you know, we all looked and said, gosh, you know, we've never thought of this. This is not something we would have necessarily run to. None of us are, are necessarily expert chefs here on our side, but we certainly love D&D and we love studying it. We, we love learning about it and looking at it through different angles and lenses. And so uh, we all sat there and had a really candid conversation about what it would mean to do a D&D book. 
how could we elevate the D&D experience by putting together a, a cookbook? So in other words, it would not be good enough for us to, you know, to slap a D&D logo, logo on a regular cookbook and say, here, look, it's the D&D cookbook. No, we, as, as historians and passionate gamers, we really wanted to make sure that if we were going to do one, it was not going to be a gimmick. It was going to be something really meaningful and that it could really contribute to the space. It could really actually advance um, the lore forward. And so that was kind of became the goal. So we got together with wizards. They loved the idea. We, we you know, bounced ideas back and forth. And ultimately what happened is, is uh, 10 Speed built this extraordinary team around us for us to basically drive the lore and a lot of, you know, a lot of conceptual elements around this book. And they surrounded us with um, professional chefs such as Adam Reed from America's Test Kitchen, spectacular chef, um, to actually build out these concepts that we were, we were coming up with. Uh, and then a team of professional photographers and prop people and everything in between, just a spectacular group of people um, to kind of see, uh, to, to build what you, what you uh, see here today with Heroes Feast. So that was, that's probably a long version of, of the story, but it was really exciting to be, uh, to be a part of it. And what you just held up was the Barnes & Noble exclusive edition, which also, if you are a fan of maps, cartography, there is an exclusive map in there. And that's um, part of, gets to the topic of, of development, how we put this book together, because it was atypical and we didn't want to approach it like a traditional cookbook. It wasn't like, let's just theme, uh, re-theme uh, 80 recipes and, and slap them in there. We, we set very high standards and said, we really want to do something that's both uh, truthful to what came before and reverent and also looks forward uh, to the future that is rooted in, in 5e and, and the way people are playing the game right now and what's relevant, but also has an eye on the past. And um, we wanted to also go backwards and, and mine those things. And we, we discussed, do we wanna organize the book via culture or do we wanna do it regionally? Um, do we, where, where are the confines of this? How big can it be? Are we talking about multiple planets and realms or are we just gonna stick in forgotten realms? Um, so all these things had to be factored and weighed, like you said, because we, we we thought about it in a very nuanced way rather than being like, like oh, yeah, let's do a cookbook. It, only if it was going to be cool and different and great. John, do you want to talk about maybe how we approached some of this development, what the criteria was or, or what the challenges were? Sure. I mean, you know, again, wanting to be reverential to the brand, we had to go back through 45 years of the history of D&D. And this isn't just a history of the game books people are familiar with, players' handbooks and Dungeon Master's guides. This is going back through modules, going through novels, going through you know, a variety of books that are written, especially for the Forgotten Realms, like the Bolo's guides that kind of describe the world and what you can find in it. And just trying to find anything that is relevant to food, to what people ate and what, you know, how that, how the, the uh, settings that they lived in kind of fed into the cuisines that these cultures consumed. And this is the kind of research task I personally love in the sense of, you know, I, I've studied d d for some time and like anything that's a fresh angle, something we haven't looked at before. Like when we did Art and Arcana, I mean, I hadn't really done a deep dive on like the art of d d before that. But like having this chance then to look at the lore of D&D, going back through and trying to find what are the modules where people talk about um, a feast, right? Like Castle Amber is a great example. You know, there's this, the, the Amberville family and like all, all of their, um, you know, bizarre feasts that the ghosts of this family like, you know, celebrate in various times. What did they eat then? And this became part of the input to the book. And, you know, I mean, these things, they... You know, we, we certainly approached it with an understanding we wanted to have a balanced book. We wanted to be able to have a variety of different cuisines. We wanted to have options for people that love meat, options for people that don't eat meat. And as a consequence, kind of having, you know, having this opportunity to go back and mine this source literature and find in it precedence for the kinds of things we knew would need to go into a balanced cookbook. I mean, it was a, an amazing kind of research project. It was a lot of fun to do. Um, you know, someone who is often buried in the historical minutia of d and This was definitely kind of like a, okay, this, this sounds like fun. I, I can imagine doing this and like, it wouldn't be just, you know, a, a dusty research chore. Um, and, you know, just figuring out what it really is that um, elves eat or dwarves eat or halflings eat and how they're different, how their palates differ, how, you know, the, the life of an elf, the fact that elves are effectively immortal beings, like how does that affect the way that they look at food. 
these are the kinds of things that I think gave us an opportunity not just to regurgitate things we found in previous source books to actually even make a contribution to the canon, right? To be able to say, okay, having looked at this, this is our assessment of the ways that these fantasy cultures actually interacted with food. So it was, yeah, it was a lot of fun. Yeah, and I think one of the big uh, contributions that I, I'm proud of in retrospect is it's the organization of it. It's the, the curating of all these things, which were which were there. It's always been prevalent in Dungeons and Dragons. You have that attention to detail and you discuss food and culture, but it was a way to collect it all and aggregate it and organize it and discuss it in a way that it was delineated and specific, which I think was something that uh, came out pretty well, especially the way the, the, the visuals really help um, bring it to life. And I think that's, um, you know, when we started down that road, there was like that, that there's the choice, which way we're going to go with it. And, you know, the cultural aspect of it really um, allowed us to present it in a way like a player's handbook is presented and you flip through and you, you, you know, find out what you identify with. And hopefully people are bringing it to their, to their tables and to their characters. Um, so Michael, um, something everyone wants to know. We're just dying to know. <laughs> what are the eating habits of halflings? Oh, can you oh, talk gosh. about halflings? Because I, I, I know I, I can't talk about it. It's it's too <laughs> secretive. I, I can't possibly. <laughs> the uh, well, so but that, they that, pop. You know what I mean? They they pop out. The cultures when you research it, they pop to the surface, and like halflings were um, vibrant, unique, and you really get a sense of them. I think, especially when you put all this stuff together. Uh, do you want to talk about? maybe that culture specifically or uh, yeah no I, so right there's so there's a chapter for for the for context one way we looked at this book we talked about how we could make it meaningful how we could contribute to the game and to the overall culture of D D. and uh and one of the ways that we thought we could do that is that um if you if you look at the book and you know the core books very well as as many many D D gamers do um you'll see that we structure this book like it was a core book in fact the way we looked at it as a development team is we said well let's just make the player's handbook, but it's all about food. So instead of, instead of analyzing what these different cultures are like um, from a fighting perspective or what, or, you know, what different classes can cast spells and do that, we just looked at everything through the lens of food. So it was like, well, what is the etiquette of this culture? What are the ingredients that are available, available to this particular group of people? Um, what do they like to cook? What, you know, what, what, are the, what are the habits? What are the dining habits? So um, that was how we looked at everything. It's like, effectively, we, we kind of thought of this as just writing the core book that's, that's just through the lens of food. And, uh, and one of the areas that we, we studied, of course, was, was halflings. Um, there's probably no D&D group that's more about food than halflings in the respect that it's, it's by far the easiest thing to find with regard to, you know, you're mining all through the, all the stuff John's talking about, modules, core books. One thing that you'll find very, very consistently is there's always stuff about food and hosting for halflings. And of course, we know halflings have, um, you know, a lot of their history kind of tied up in, in hobbits, right? So you can, you can actually go back and you can, you can look at a little bit, of, a, a certain amount of what you know about halflings from what we see with, you know, Bilbo Baggins and, and you know, what's in his larder and, and you know, what happens when, you know, the, the dwarves visit his house. Um, so, you know, so one thing that you see with halflings is that they're, they're decadent typically in their dining. They love dining, they obsess about it, they think about it. It's all about, you know, it's cheese and butter and more salt and, um, and but of course also a really, really vibrant vegetable garden, right? That's the, that's the pride of any halfling home is their, their vegetable garden. So fruits and vegetables also a big part of their dining. And of course they're known for having multiple breakfasts, sometimes multiple lunches and dinners, right? So, um, and we reference that in the book, you know, second, you know, evening feast or second uh, morning, morning feast. So um, yeah, you know, with halflings, um, again, like a lot of uh, agrarian people, they, they farm, they, they get what's readily available. Um, they have, they raise um, sheep and they raise cattle in some cases. Um, and they, they eat, you know, a really, really broad diet of, of different things. But um, it was fun to kind of look at what they think about and what they do. And that was one of the easiest ones to find a lot of information on. So again, I, I do really recommend that if you, if you do check out this book, um, Please read these these things that we've we've built out. We think they're you know they're well researched uh, at a minimum, and we think they, they do add a little bit to the D and D lore. 
Yeah, I think what's what's great about say something like halflings and they're so they're indulgent and they let their stomachs do the thinking for them. And a lot of that, you know, is in the pedigree of of Tolkien's writing. But um it's something that's become true. And a lot of these fantasy races, things we know about elves are are cold from many different sources now over over time. And it's become they've they've developed an identity uh, where you know elves are very thoughtful and conscious of the land. And like John mentioned earlier, they live much longer. So they have a different relationship with time and with 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 each other and then with humans and then with uh, you know, with food. And all these things are, are, are programmed into what you think about, just like dwarves, um, what's what's accessible to a dwarf? You know, they pr predominantly live underground. And so there's obviously certain things that aren't gonna grow there that aren't gonna be uh, sourced, um, what what is going to be available to them? How are they going to do it? What do they have at their disposal? These these um, massive, you know, kilns and and fires, and it's all about community. So each each there's a certain philosophy that um, logically can be, you know, uh, felt through these things, and we tried to feel our way through them. And also, it was also just readily available to pull from these sources to support it. And you realize, oh my God, there is something here. And it, it's always been there. We're just having, we're just shining a light on it now in a cool way by pulling some of these different references and quotes and all these things together to, to help um, shape it, you know, in that, in that package. Uh, and you talked about, you know, the, that scene in Lord of the Rings and thinking about it, it is one of the more famous times you probably have like a meal between two fantasy cultures. And there's that scene also when they're in um, in The Hobbit, where they're in Rivendell. It was a deleted scene. Um, I think it was a severely truncated scene. And the behavior, the the beyond just the food, it's also how people approach food, the ceremony around food, um, what its purpose is more than just consumption and it's satiating you, but uh, the ritual and the preparation and what it means in the in the greater culture and uh those are all fascinating things too and, I, and, I, and it kind of permeates these different these fantasy cultures and humans themselves you know have their own story in there which i think is one of the more fascinating things that we we were able to tackle um, i mean personally i go in with Gollum. you know like i just ate sushi tonight so give it to me raw and wriggling you keep nasty chips i think um it's more or less where i am sorry mike you were saying no, well, no, that's far more insightful than anything I have to say. I, no, just simply that it's something that, that John alluded to earlier and you, Kyle, as well. That, like, it was so strange um, to, to go through D&D books and modules that you've, you've read or you've looked at a hundred times and you never had cause to, like, look at the little menu that they built for so-and-so tavern in so-and-so town and so-and-so D&D. You, know, you, you never had any cause to really pay any attention to the fact that there was, like, eight to ten things they listed there that you could get. Presumably, the the author of the module just wanted you to have some options and wanted to make sure you could get mead here, or maybe there was a special brandy or whatever. Um, and, and so, to be able to look at those things through that lens and say, "Well, this is important now. This is canon material that we actually get to draw from and 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 use." And let's let's assume that there was some good reason that they put it in there that they decided to put twelve people things on the menu. Um, that's not always the case. You know, we, we know that sometimes it's fairly arbitrary, but sometimes it is. I mean, think about um, now going to the novel side of the house. Think about the way um, uh, the Dragonlance series handles food. It's I mean, uh, Oddix spiced potatoes come up, you know, 20 times in, in that first trilogy. Um, that's an important thing. It, it's meant to represent a very particular experience that these adventurers had had. And every time they mention it, Presumably, it's a call back to the end of the last home. The idea that that's one of the the touchstones they have to you know to to kind of the, the, the great memory of when the band was still together, right? Um, so again, there's a lot of different ways it kind of comes up, but it was a really fun process to be able to look at it through that lens and really like pay attention to something you never you just kind of glossed over in the past. Maybe some people spent a lot of time on on food in D and D. Um, we can tell you by by the amount of stuff that was out there that it was not an area that was particularly you know, well developed throughout the entire you know set of literature, um, and it was an area that we learned a lot about of uh, a, a lot about um, during our research. Certainly, that was a lot of fun. Yeah, I think food serves uh, really two purposes. There's that longing for home if you're an adventurer, uh, what keeps you sane and rooted to where you've come from, and then there's the exploration side of it. And there's there's people that want to go out there and explore, experience new things, and and I think the the book satiates those two things if you look at it from a, from a player exploring it um you know and, well, and also i mean yeah. you know what it is to be a companion 
is to be, you know, with people you break bread with, right? That's the meaning of the word, literally. And so there is something that's very, you know, tied in, I think, to essentially the idea of a party, an idea of a collaborating group of adventurers that goes naturally with eating together. And this is to the whole out exposed potatoes point. I mean, this, this, this becomes a touchstone for you. And we hope we, you know, it's our ambition that like, you know, people experiencing D&D, if they can experience the kind of food we're writing about in this book together, they'll have their own touchstones that they can draw back on. Absolutely. Um, so artwork, artwork was a, illustrations were a big factor in our, our last book. Obviously it wasn't stuff we, we had, uh, commissioned, but um, illustrations drove that book and illustrations also factored into this book. Obviously it's primarily uh, photographic and this is one of the first times people really uh, depicted D&D in photography because um, it's normally about illustration and imagination. And once you get into photography, you're really locking it in into a lighting, a tone and a texture. It becomes very real, grounded. Uh, to contrast that and complement it, we also wanted these palette cleanser, um, chapter openings. Do you want to talk about some of the illustrations, the original artwork done for this book and how it was laid out and visually conceived the book? Um, Michael? I, uh, yeah, no, I mean, I, I can start on the illustration side. I actually may want to throw it right back to you. One of my favorite parts about working with a director like yourself, Kyle, is that um, every time, anytime original illustration comes up, I feel like you know exactly what you want to see. You know, you've got, it's, you know, I, I can think of a couple of elements usually, oh, I'd love to have this in there. You know, Kyle's already got the whole picture. You know, it's all planned out. Everything from, you know, the sky and the clouds to what's in the background and who's lurking around this corner. So uh, one, one of the, 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 the big, you know, um, things that I, that I love, you know, working with this group is that we all bring something very different to the table. And, and I, I love your, um, you know, you, you definitely see the whole picture, especially when it comes to these art direction pieces. And so with illustration, and I want to turn it back to you truly, oh, yeah. is this idea that um, we got to work directly with, you know, the wonderful art director, directors at 10 speed and with, um, with, with D&D artists to put together these I, I, many, many um, original pieces of art to kind of, uh, I guess show the whole gamut of the food experience, not just people eating, which would have been very obvious, but um, people sourcing food, hunting, um, gathering, farming. But Kyle, yeah, yeah I mean, I, that you were obviously a, a huge driver uh, on that. Anything that you wanted to say? Well, I remember we, we first went down this road and we, we were thinking of just um, pulling some images from, from fifth edition that uh, depicted food or you know, people in taverns, or there's this close-up of cake from the player's handbook. And some of it felt too small for this book. We're already doing close-ups on food and the illustrations didn't need to service that. And so we evolved it into this idea uh, that each chapter, each chapter heading should um, showcase an aspect of the life. Uh, and we didn't want redundancy. So you look at halflings, we're talking about like, you know, there we go. And it's really about, you know, there's the halfling up here and this, the sun's going down and, they're, you know, working the fields and, and they've got elven cuisine there and there's a ceremony around it and, and um, the human, it's about the hunt and the collection of the food and what goes into that. So we wanted them to highlight something unique to those cultures and also take you through these different phases of uh, the pomp and circumstance around food. And they did serve as these palate cleansers because you go deep into these visuals of, of what say, you know, what's on the dwarven table. And then you turn the page and then you, it brightens up and you're in this halfling, you're above the ground now and we're in this sunny world and there's pastures and livestock and it's a very different, world than where you just emerge from with the with the dwarven food so i think that was really fun and that's those are the discoveries you make as you're going through the book oh there's an easter egg there's a lot of easter eggs in this book um and those are the discoveries you make when you're visually laying out the book you conceive of it and you this is the same with art and arcana you you write the book and we we laid it all out and then we made visual connections between images and in this case it was how how can we service the story of heroes feast better with these choice illustrations, when we use them, how we use them. Another thing that was great was we commissioned some uh, artifacts, magical items from the Dungeons and Dragons universe, legendary items um, 
borrowed one from Miss Ararak. Uh, we had uh, Justin Gobi Fields, who is a friend. He's a designer, concept artist, model builder, does a little bit of everything. And he made these uh, four wonderful objects, which you can see there's, there's one right there, one of the dragon orbs. Uh, we've got the talisman of ultimate evil, the hand of Vecna. Um, what else have we got in here? Talisman of the sphere is in there. Um, so it's fun to put those things in there next to coinage, next to uh, different props, friends from you know, Death Saves, Beetle and Grimm's, Dwarven Forge, all contributed little Easter eggs in there throughout. So that was cool. So there's other ways to bring D&D alive, which you see more and more in the cultures happening when you get like a Beetle and Grimm's box set, they immerse you with maps and, and coin and prop and all this stuff. So that was fun. Yeah, there's some, there's a vial of poison right there. And a and, and there's your talisman blade. of ultimate evil there. Yep. Uh, so I thought that uh, really turned up the volume on the authenticity beyond just, again, naming it uh, after something or a region. There really was a lot more thought as to how to make these recipes left of center. What could we inject into something familiar and delectable and also forward thinking and healthy, but something that makes it feel just a little bit um, atypical, just a little bit D&D, &D, and that's what D&D &D is. Um, John, I skipped you before. I wanted to talk about the photography, because that's a big part of it. Um, do you want to talk about maybe the, the photography in this book and and the thought process behind? Uh... Well, I mean, this was like one of the more fun parts of doing this, really. So we all got together, actually, in Burbank in February of what year was that? Was that 2020? <laughs> I, yeah, it's all it a blur. It was 2020, now. you're right. It was, it was, it was, it was right before, yeah. But no, a year that's ago. Exactly, yeah. But I mean, that whole process. So we had professional prop artists, professional photographers. We had food stylists. We, this amazing team convened around this book. And so, I mean, this it's a great, it was great for us because we got to eat all the stuff right? <laughs> made by professional food stylists. So we stayed very well fed um, for the entire duration of photography of this. But I mean, it really was, we felt this pretty solemn obligation actually, because we were bringing d, &D to life, right? I mean, as Kyle said earlier, like it's not like photography has been the usual medium through which people, you know, understand the expression of d, &D. and, you know, taking it to the food context I mean, you needed to be able to do all the prop stylings that Kyle was just talking about, going to our friends at Beetle and Grimm, going to Joe Manganello, going to, you know, Stephen Corney, like everybody who has really brought D&D physically to life and getting as many of those artifacts as possible to kind of adorn the tables where this very delicious, actually, <laughs> food was being prepared that, you know, we could then photograph for it. And it, it was a really fun process. I mean, it was kind of, I don't know what to describe it like. I mean, it was it was like being at like a Ren fair or something. Because we just had these like massive tables filled with just props, like Hollywood grade props, cool chalices, plates, silverware. And I mean, we all brought stuff from our own like private stashes as well that you'll see a lot of stuff from my household actually um, <laughs> in the book. A lot of the knives, a lot of swords, things like that. Um, so, I mean, that that was an amazing process because it was so much fun to just figure out, okay, we know we're going to take a picture of some food, but how do we make sure every picture feels like it's in the D and D universe? And we just tried to make sure no matter what it was, there were accoutrements, setting, lighting, you know, in some cases, special effects, in some cases, amazing 3d printed props of, you know, artifacts and stuff, whatever it took to make sure that like every page communicated, this isn't just a regular cookbook. This is D and D. Yeah. You know, and, um, let me, I, I'm sorry, Kyle. Uh, yeah, go just for it, go to for add it. to that, um, it, the the fun part about the, the propping again, it, it, we certainly felt a real responsibility because this is one of the first times we were really bringing D and D to life. Even though we were looking, you know, close up at food, um, you know, anytime, for example, you see like money in the shot, it's very likely that it's a it's not just like a generic pirate gold coin you buy online. It's probably a gold dragon from Waterdeep that we have you know, from some stash we got. When you see like a map on a table that's, you know, stabbed down with a dagger, it's, it's, a, it's like an aged map of the Sword Coast or of, you know, a, 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 again, of some particular D&D locale. That was the kind of detail that we really, really got excited about. And, and again, um, 10 Speed supported us every step of the way. I mean, again, we really kind of spared no expense when it came to 
the level of detail we could go to. Um, and yeah, a lot of times this stuff is just very much in the background, um, but it was really important for us to have that level of, of authenticity. And I think we did hit those notes. So it was pretty fun. That was a highlight for me for sure. It wasn't just food. It's, it's depicting what it might look like inside Fling's abode or, um, you know, there you go. That's my laboratory. house on Saturday night on, you know, this stuff. <laughs> Yeah, I think that was just just as important for us as, as showcasing the food, but it's just like making you feel like you're there. Look at the, and if you look really closely, that little mug it has a little halfling dancing on it, and there's a pipe. It looks like Gandalf was just there. <laughs> um, so, Michael, what was your favorite part about working on this book? Because it did become a, a labor of love. I know you ended up making how many recipes from the book? Yeah, well, I'm at. Um, I, I I almost made them all. I've I've made seventy of the eighty dishes. Um, and at, at this point, and, and again, I, I still mean to make the last few. I had a couple of failures. Uh, again, I'm not, I'm not an expert chef myself, um, but I learned an awful lot. And, and it, it really helped me kind of think about the food differently to contribute. Um, probably one thing that's worth mentioning is, is how that process worked, actually. Um, uh, so what would happen with regard to how these dishes came about and what our role was as, as the D&D people in this was that um, we would we would find we would do the research and we would find the dish whether it was something that came directly out, off the pages of a novel or from a, a, an adventure module um, or something that we could extrapolate very very safely from other you know canonical material that we could find and, and kind of extrapolate out. But what would happen is we would we would come up with a dish um, and we would typically write a head note for it. The head notes are in the book, so those are in world head notes. We basically write that this is a real thing and. Oh, this comes from Waterdeep, and it's very popular here. You know, get whatever we could find that's rooted in D and D lore. And typically, what we would do is we would try to give really good direction, as, as good as we were able, at least, to Adam Reed to 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 be able to build this dish uh, in our world. So we would say, oh, this is um, this is a dish that typically uses these ingredients uh, in in the Faerun or in uh, wherever the dish uh, may come from. Uh, and it tastes like this, or it has these particular elements, or and and Adam would kind of take it from there. But we would do our best to not only give him the backstory, but also to to give him a sense of of what's in it, or or kind of what the core ingredients were. Um, and again, a lot of times, what would happen is is they would um, they would come back to us and give us something that we said, oh no, we forgot to tell them about this or that, and it felt really awkward to be honest to go back to professional uh, food people and say, oh gosh, this doesn't work because they don't have this ingredient in this region of, you know, uh, of the Forgotten Realms or whatever the case may be. Uh, that didn't happen a lot, but it certainly happened a little bit. So it, it was a really cool, fun, dynamic process where we got to, to try to really bring these things to life. Um, and yeah, so I, I, I personally felt obligated to make a ton of these dishes, uh, which was a great way to really kind of spend time with, with my family here, especially uh, as we got uh, more and more into the pandemic, we were doing a lot of cooking at home. And um, it was it was a really neat way to kind of experiment with these and usually and, and sometimes find something that was like, you know, can we double check this or, or what about adding this and, and they were very kind to be responsive to even some of those suggestions so um, so yeah it was it was a lot of fun. Okay. Yeah, and you know we had to we did have to research a lot, which was also I think uh, for me one of the more fun things I know john that's your your real expertise what were, were some of the. What was the highlight for you about uh, collaborating on this book? I mean, you know, I mean, just selfishly, I love drinks. And so like doing the drinks part of this was maybe the most fun for me, um, especially like looking at, you know, uh, it was more whimsical, I guess. We gave ourselves more leeway in terms of the lore on this. We thought about different names that drinks would have in different places. Oh, this is here known as a delayed blast fireball. Here it's known as a cone of cold, like for a different, you know, different kind of beverage entirely. And so that part was certainly a lot of fun to do. Like the research part of it, again, for me, anything that isn't something I've done before that's like fresh is extremely welcome. And so just being able to look at it through that lens, to be able to go back through, to look, you know, what really is the story of the, dream, the green dragon inn in Greyhawk? Like it's something that's alluded to in a few places. There's this amazing um, uh, coloring book, right? That has this beautiful visualization of the Green Dragon Inn, but like trying to figure out like what would have been served there, like what's really seasonal for places like Hamlet or, you know, take, take your pick of the old school d, d realms. Like as a research task, that was an interesting task. It's material. It's something that there's not a lot of received lore about. And so things like that, they were, they were a lot of fun for me to do. 
Yeah, I, I, I love the the research. Anytime someone can say, you got to go read a bunch of D&D books. <laughs> That's your job right now. I, I was excited. I was going back to all the, the Leaves books, Every Volo Guide, the Aurora's Catalog, and all just reading. Now when I read a novel, like reading Elminster, Making of a Mage again, and I'm, I stop here. Oh, wow. Chapter three, they're talking about dried beefs. Let me write this down. So it's just like your mind is trained to just pick out these foods that you just kind of gloss over. But you're like, actually, that's saying something about what's available there and 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 how you can learn something about the people by how they prepare their food, what what is available to them. Um, just look at you just look at D and D books now in a different way. And there's we have to put parameters on it. Well, how far can we go? You know, you have you you have Athos and you have the barbarian halflings of At Athos. You know, we can't we can't go that far. So we had to. Maybe that's but, but wasn't book. doing Hebron was great though, right? Because Hebron, Hebron isn't great, perhaps yeah. as well known as some of these older places are. But we found a whole bunch of stuff right related to Corbera, related to I mean. You know, we, we have some, I know Mike's favorite dish is the dragon salmon, right? Yes, like, it is. Which is a, an Eberron dish, a half elven dish. Why don't you tell us a bit about it, Mike? Yeah. Oh, gosh, the dragon salmon, that was probably my single favorite dish in the book. Um, I had it that night with what we call Harvest Prize, which is like a, um, um, uh, it's kind of like a, like a, a sweet potato mash, basically. Um, and gosh, what else did we have that night? I think we had the meal's end, which was another. So when we did our meals at home, we would plan them as as elven feasts or as dwarven feasts or halfling or whatever. We would try to prepare it all together to make sure it all worked really well. And um, so, yeah, so the dragon salmon, that one was a real highlight. Uh, my mother-in-law was in town at the time when we made that. I remember she was blown away by it. It has this tremendous like butter sauce with shallots. Um, I'm trying to remember what else was in it. It, it was it was it was spectacular. It was it was the best salmon I've ever had. Um, and, uh, again, it was, it was something that was well, be, well beyond my expectations. So, um, there was many, many things I would say very, very high marks on pretty much anything in the Elven section, the halfling section, those section, those were my favorite uh, pieces. And they're very different by the way. Most of the Elven stuff is kind of actually much lighter fare, a lot of vegetarian dishes. Um, and then of course the halfling stuff's extremely decadent. Um, but, but those two, um, kind of bookends for me were, were the best parts but everything I think is great so very worthwhile yeah I think for me it's been the response has, has been blown me away um we were hoping we'd do something that you know people would check out and get excited about that would connect um maybe in these times where you can't um can't play as much or you can't connect with your group as much but maybe it brings D&D &D back into your house something that's been missing and it seems like people really took to it you know just noticing groups on Facebook like there's a Heroes Feast uh fan page and seeing the way people take that homebrew spirit to heart and they're like you know what I tried it with this or I do this every time I'm gonna um you know work with ground beef and there's everyone's putting their tips up there all in the spirit of this and and um people are sharing their ideas for things so that that's been really exciting to see people not just, you know, make the recipes and talk about, but post pictures and see how it comes to life and try to emulate it and also do it with, with fantasy uh, themes going on. And we did a cool piece for Dragon Plus, which is out right now, um, about holidays and how, how you can go, kind of go through here and tie certain recipes or curate a menu for a holiday. We did one for uh, Valentine's Day, but there's a lot of research we did into the holidays and you know, we're not just sticking with one planet in D&D. We, we had to really focus on four planets. Um, so you're not, you're talking about elves as they're, as they live on four different realms, you know, humans too. So the, there is it, a lot, you know, and it's, it's cool to see people uh, take to it and the way their imaginations are, are carried on. And hopefully we get to do more. I mean, that's the, that's the, um, that's the goal because we we probably generated 130 i think uh concepts and I had to start whittling it down now you were trying to make a balanced menu and hero's feast um is a spell from the game uh with special connotations and power but we did want it to be balanced so you can't have too many bread recipes you can't have too many soups so um it was built like a menu and we did have these in-world menus and John you mentioned the green dragon um there's also the Yawning portal and the the end of the last home and so we tried to um put something in there for people so you can get a sense of what else might be available if you're in this region as as a character what those costs might be uh what are drinks like um 
and that I think was one of the other uh, challenge. Seems like it's just oh, there's a there's a menu, but there's a you know that's curated from all these different sources. Uh, seeing what was available in those regions near Waterdeep, what might be in other inns, and populating the menu accordingly, um, so you get a sense of the flavors and what it might be like to wander into one of those places and peruse what's on offer. Yeah, those were fun. Um, and, uh, you know, I think uh, we'll see. We'll see. Maybe there's maybe there's more coming down the pipe. There could be. I mean, I think if everybody watching this buys five copies, there will surely be a sequel. <laughs> I think yes. that's, uh, that's the uh, we're, arithmetic. We're definitely working on some stuff together uh, for the future, um, which we, we can't totally talk about yet, but we are reuniting. Sam will be joining us um, as well uh, in the future. Um, John, what are you working on next? So I've got a book coming out actually this fall that's called Game Wizards. It's actually about the early kind of corporate history of the people who made D&D, of the company TSR. So before Wizards bought TSR, kind of the story of Gary Gygax and Dave Arneson and kind of what happened to them when they made this amazing game that nobody expected would take off, but it did. I think that comes out in like October, something like that. Cool. That's great. I'm excited. I was just looking at that on Amazon the other day. <laughs> I want an early copy. You'll, you'll get it. Uh, you'll get an early copy. You will personally call. Yes. Awesome. Thank you. Michael, what are you, what do you got cooking over there? Right. Rise up to a lot. Yeah, no, there is, there is a lot. I've, I've always got lots of, lots of ideas and things floating around. Um, I've been working on a young adult fiction uh, novel that um, I've I finished up relatively re uh, recently. So I'm, I'm hopeful that, that that'll land somewhere at some point. Um, I've, I've got, I've had a, a Disney book that I've been trying to, yes. to piece together for a few years. And I, it's a concept I really love, but I haven't quite figured out how to solve every aspect of it yet. So that, I mean, again, you know, you know how it is when you've got partially developed projects and whatnot, I've got a handful of those. So yeah, I, I'm, um, I'm optimistic that, you know, that some of these things, uh, may move forward at some point, but, uh, in the meantime, yeah, I, I'm certainly very excited to be working with this group again, um, on an unnamed project, but um, but yeah, so far so good. I've been very happy. Well, what about you, Kyle? Uh, what, yeah, did, what, what you did you made recently a movie. finish? You made a movie, yeah, I didn't did. you? I just I heard about production. that. Yeah, I wrapped production on a movie uh, for Lionsgate and BuzzFeed Studios. I directed it and um, it's called One Up. It's about uh, girl gamers in the world of competitive esports. So it's collegiate esports and it's comedy and it's really really funny ruby rose is in it uh we've got a wonderful cast it's coming out march 2022 uh so i am in post-production currently on that right now and i just had a baby Ten congratulations so, congrats, congrats. <laughs> it's been a busy time but you know i'm looking forward to our collaboration this year i think we're, we've got some some good stuff uh you got some good stuff we're not talking about we're just going to keep teasing you about it we're sorry <laughs> Yes. Um, well, I want to thank everybody for coming to uh, WonderCon, our, our Culinary Adventures and Dungeons and Dragons panel. Uh, like I said, there is there are two versions of the book. If you are interested in checking it out further, we've got Heroes Feast, the official D&D cookbook, which is available everywhere. Um, probably get the best prices right now on Amazon. Uh, but if you are into cartography, there is an alternate exclusive um, variation on the cover with uh, Jared Blondo map uh, in there, which kind of, you know, explores um, some of the regions uh, and the highlights of Forgotten Realms. Um, Michael's got it right there. Ooh, yeah, if you're a map person, that that's that's the one you want. Um, so it's it's out there in the wild. It's great to see something like that. It's great to have your name on something like that. It was such a tremendous team effort uh, and I, that's what I love about working with um, our friends at Dungeons and Dragons and our friends at Ten Speed. And um, you know, I can say one thing is uh, the, the 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 sum of it all is 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 even better than the parts. That's what's always great. We get together and we make something that I just want as a fan on my shelf, and there it is. It's like, and I was a part of it. Whoa, this is so cool. So it's always a joy working with with uh, with both of you, and it's always a joy to get together to talk about. Dungeons and Dragons, especially for WonderCon, it's sad that we're not there this year. It's sad that no one's there this year, but we're all here in, in spirit, and I'm sure we'll be back next year. So um, do you guys have any final words out, out there? Just thanks. Thanks for having us. Enjoy. 
Yes, thank you very much, WonderCon. Thank you, WonderCon. Yes, stay safe, everybody. Stay healthy and keep rolling those 20s.